Our speaker this evening, Dr. Douglas Brinkley, is distinguished professor of history at Rice University, having joined the James Baker Institute for Public Policy in July of last year. He previously was a, history, a professor of history at Tulane University, where he also served as director of the Theodore Roosevelt Center for American Civilization. Dr. Brinkley is the history commentator for CBS News and a contributing editor to the magazine Vanity Fair. He earned his BA from Ohio State and his PhD from Georgetown University. He has taught at Princeton, the US Naval Academy, and Hofstra University, and has earned several honorary doctorates for his contributions to American letters. Five of his award-winning books have been selected as New York Times Notable Books of the Year, and he is a recipient of the prestigious Benjamin Franklin Award and the Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt Naval History Prize. The late historian Stephen Ambrose once called Brinkley the best of the new generation of American historians. Their collaborations resulted in three books, The Rise of Globalism, published in 1998, Witness to History the following year, and The Mississippi and the Making of a Nation, 2002. All this time, Dr. Brinkley was building his BEAT credentials. In 1999, he contributed an essay on The American Journey of Jack Kerouac to the Rolling Stone Book of the Beats in 19, well, to the Rolling Stone Book of the Beats. In 2004, Viking Press published under the title Windblown World, his edition of the journals of Jack Kerouac, dating from 1947 to 1954. And he served as editor of Jack Kerouac Road Novels, 1957 to 1960, published last September in the Library of America series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brinkley. Well, good evening. Thank you for coming. And it's a great privilege to be here at the Ransom Center. It's one of the premier institutions in the United States for dealing with 20th century American history. In fact, my wife, who's in the front row, and I came here, moved to Austin. I had written a book on Hurricane Katrina called The Great Deluge. And uh, we were trying to make it work in New Orleans, but we had three kids, and we always loved Austin. And um, even though I'm teaching at Rice, we, we go, I go back and forth in the fall, but we live here in Austin nine months out of the year. And one of the real reasons I wanted to come here, because I knew when I was old and gray and couldn't lecture anymore, I could always hobble up to the Ransom Center and go through their collections with our endless and get a little money for an article from the Atlantic Monthly or, or the New Yorker or the like, because um, this has become the Athens of America, Austin, for people working on America in the 20th century, meaning it's becoming an intellectual center. It's where the manuscripts of so many writers um, of the 20th century are, are now being housed right in the building that we're at right now. And um, I've gotten to become friends with um, Tom Staley, and he does a terrific job here. And I was thrilled, in addition to his own collections, he's taken the time to care about Jack Kerouac. They have some Kerouac holdings here, but to have the scroll come to Austin has been quite a, um, quite a big event. So I'm truly pleased to be here this evening. Um, Jack Kerouac came to me. One of the great things about Kerouac as a writer is the people that like him or discover him, they always have a story when they first encountered him. I was working in a little town called Perrysburg, Ohio, where I grew up, and I was working at the Perrysburg Holiday Inn, and I had told somebody there that I liked Bob Dylan music a lot. Uh, I was just starting to discover Dylan, and they had given me a copy of On the Road. Uh, I read it and was very turned on by the book. Turned on in the sense that my mother and father were teachers. My mom was teaching at my high school in Perrysburg, and we had a 24-foot coachman trailer. And we spent our summer vacations going around America for about eight weeks every summer. So I got the opportunity to have my own family on the roads where I'd sit in the back of the station wagon and visit Yellowstone and Yosemite. And uh, I used to love being positioned in the back of the car. And I had a, a poodle dog named Hector next to me and a cooler 
and you get to see all of that America rolling past you, uh, which is really, in as many ways, the same sensation. I was just loved being in the car. I almost enjoyed the journey from point A to point B as much as I did going to the historic sites or the natural sites. I liked stopping in truck stops and gas stations and uh, roadside restaurants. Um, even when I was young, my sister wanted to instead go to places like SeaWorld and Disney World, but I just kept wanting to do the long road trips, and I would literally like uh, my dad would pull out the atlas and he'd help we would take it and I'd plan where to go with him and we would have a shortwave radio to get Detroit Tiger baseball in the um, in the camp so I had a kind of all-american um, situation well that's different than the novel on the road on the roads about it's not it's it, in many ways though as I was becoming a teenager and I no want no longer wanted to go on those family vacations uh, that it was not not uh, cool to be with mom and dad anymore for my summers that I wanted to be with peers it became a transition book and that's the first thing I wanted to make a point about Kerouac's On the Road it's the great American coming of age book the late Norman Mailer once told me when I interviewed him about On the Road he said it seems easy but it's very hard to capture that moment like right after college when you can do anything for two years and you might might go to Africa on the Peace Corps, you might go do an odd job, and if any of you have, have children that are hitting that point, there's that sort of open window of possibility there. That's what Kerouac's capturing in On the Road. What has mixed up people's impression of the novel tremendously is that it was published in 1957, the year of Sputnik, the year after James Dean and Marlon Brando were big, big stars. But the diaries, the book itself, the road journeys Kerouac took were during the Truman years. They were d done in 47, 1947 and 48. It is a book about what happened to the GI Bill when all of these young men were coming back from soldiers. Kerouac himself had been in the Merchant Marines. It didn't go well for him. But he was of that age of the World War II vet. He lost his closest friend from Lowell, Massachusetts, Sebastian Sampas, was killed at Anzio. And so, you know, it's that age that these guys were all in their 20s and looking what to do. And lo and behold, we had post-World War II prosperity kicking in. You started getting, by the late 40s, the automobile being used now as a true enjoyment tool. If you recall, if the Model T revolution of Henry Ford's started in the 1920s, but, uh, but automobiles were created for luxury cars. The genius of Henry Ford and the moving assembly line is those little Model Ts were so left, you, they got stuck in a mud hole, you could pop them out, lift them out, and move them. But the 1930s were a depression. If you had a car, you were lucky, and it was essential transportation for people. There was no idea of an automobile as kicks, as joy trips, in this kind of way that this post-Truman um, era GIs coming back started doing. They had experienced Europe, they experienced Asia, and they were starting to drift more and more. And so by the time I became an undergraduate at Ohio State, having read Jack Kerouac um, from my generation, and we started almost, there was almost a, if you didn't know how to say his name properly, or if you didn't know who he was, you were somehow not with it. You were kind of out of it. Kerouac was a bonding experience for people in college reading him. And part of it was there's beyond the sense of searching for oneself, which people when they're in their 20s t do, um, which is in the novel, there's a romanticism to it. In fact, a, probably an irresponsible romanticism. Hey, you know, and, you know I'm going to take off and go from coast to coast, and I'm going to hitchhike with friends, or I'm going to hop rides. And it's a kind of, the whole novel's infused in many ways with a, a kind of juvenile ecstasy enthusiasm. It's best read, and I'm going to explain at the end of my talk, while it's a classic for adults too and why it's important to read, but it's best read when you're young. At that point, that novel becomes almost like an, an action-driven thing. It makes you want to go do something. It replaced the lost generation novels of Ernest Hemingway or the, you know, the movable feast or 
of um, you know, Fitzgerald and that whole go to Europe that had become so popular in the 1920s and 1930s. By the 40s and 50s, it was let's go discover America. Um, and the irony that this book, and, and one of the things that frustrates a scholar of Jack Kerouac or anybody who takes him seriously is that he's been maligned over the years as somehow being anti-American. I mean, this is about as American an apple pie Alamo book you're going to find. He's celebrating American nameplaces, American cities. Um, you know, he's writing a poem for America in the romantic tradition of Walt Whitman and of uh, Thoreau's Great Hermit Walks, both books which influenced him a lot. The other part of Kerouac that I think some people mistake is because it's he always would brag that it's spontaneous prose and that I typed it up on the scroll in a mad frenzy. Um, well, Hemingway used to lie to people and tell them that he wrote his short stories uh, in a night and he'd read them at the cafe when he had been toiling over the story for about three months. It's part of an artiste fashion as in when you're operating as a persona writer like Kerouac was to show that you're an intuitive genius that your skills come out. You're, it's a deception of not showing your workload. And when we now know about Jack Kerouac, due to the archives, due to collected letters, go to the journals, shouldn't surprise us, this guy worked his tail off, nonstop, trying to create original American prose. The hardest thing for a writer is to find their voice. In Kerouac, I can open up any page of his book and say, that's Jack Kerouac, that's Jack Kerouac. You're not going to confuse it with the New Yorker writer. You're not going to confuse it with any, that might, as beautiful as other writers' prose are, he found his unique voice. Well, of course, the, 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 it came to him, I think, the best way to start his journey to understanding how he found that voice in On the Road was that the fact that he ha his first language was French. He didn't learn English till he was six years old. His parents were from Quebec. They moved into Lowell, Massachusetts, which was the famous textile town of the 19th century. He had the Lowell girls, and it was in uh, his. Um, he had a father who ran a Leo who ran a printing shop, so he was around printing presses quite a bit, which got him very interested in the written word. He had a fairly normal childhood. A, in growing up in Lowell, with the exception that his older brother, Gerard, died when he was young, and it devastated him. He worshipped his older brother. He later in life wrote a book called Visions of Gerard about the death of his brother and about walking the gloomy Merrimack River of Textile Mill, Lowell, with the sun going down at dusk, and he's just felt like every, his whole life left him because his older brother died and he's haunted his whole life by his brother's shroud, his ghost. Um, part of that is infused by his deep love of Catholicism. Um, he, was became, he was taught by priests. He would write about the uh, term beat came from Kerouac, going, sitting in an empty church and looking at the beatitudes you know, of, of Christ. Um, there's a, he's a re deeply religious seeker and religious writer in some ways. But the, the, if you go back to Lowell now, later in other novels of his, uh, like Town in the City, for example, he'll romanticize this town. Uh, but it was a blue-collar town, and he lived in the French-Canadian community speaking French, and he was that first-generation immigrant um, person who tends to celebrate America now. I've been in Houston, and I was recently with people from India and Pakistan. If you want to talk about big lovers of America, see some of these new immigrants that have come into Houston and have bought their first house and are making it here, and they have that kind of enthusiasm. That was Jack Kerouac's enthusiasm for America. When he went on it, he played football in high school at Lowell and then got a football scholarship to Columbia University. His juvenile writings, which have been published, um, are all about, I love the Brooklyn Dodgers and ice cream and... He rolls off all the things in America that he loves. Then as an undergraduate at Columbia, 
he discovered he breaks his leg, can't play football, and there's a good aspect and a bad aspect to this. Of this, um, the good aspect is spent a lot of time in the library, started reading Shakespeare and the great romantic novels of Thomas Wolfe and Jack London and recognized that's what he wanted to do with his life, was to be like them. On the other hand, he started spending a lot of time around Times Square uh, in um, saloons, uh, hanging around with, um, with people that were essentially drifters, um, not the traveling hobo types, but people that were um, smoking pot or were involved in petty crime in some ways. He got mixed up in a questionable crowd, yet um, so you can see a kind of, the, these, he's operating in the Ivy League world of Columbia and football and then hanging around with these deviant kind of characters. Well, out of this Columbia years becomes his deep literary friendship with William S. Burroughs. Burroughs was older. Burroughs was from St. Louis. His father had been with Burroughs Machine Company, so he came from money. And uh, Burroughs was deeply alienated. Um, he was, be, was um, a heroin addict for a lot of period of years. He was unbelievably brilliant. I would argue William Burroughs is one of the four or five uh, most significant American writers since World War II. It's hard reading, Naked Lunch, and Junkie, and Queer, and some of his books, but Burroughs is, is, uh, is maybe ahead of other writers. Mailer himself used to say he's probably the only writer of my generation that conceivably has true, true genius in him. He's been written up Burroughs a lot as being a Swifty and like Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travel, I mean a Swiftian um, sat, a satirist, but it's very dark, Burroughs' world, but also very darkly funny. There's not a lot in common between Burroughs and Jack Kerouac. And then Allen Ginsberg added to the mix who's at Columbia and is the son of a gay poet, or he's gay himself, or becomes gay, or discovers his, uh, his homosexuality. He's a uh, radical Communist Party, red diaper kind of, of character. And they form this bond, Burroughs, um, Allen Ginsberg, and Jack Kerouac, among others, I don't, which we don't have time. This isn't a, a lecture on the beat generation. But um, what they share is a love of language, a belief in each other, that they're going to make it as writers, a bit of a disdain for the conformity of the mainstream press. You know, when Allen Ginsberg rallies against Time Magazine and the people that are writing this sort of regurgitating kind of news flashes and all that don't have anything to do with the soul. Um, there used to be a way that you were supposed to act and sound if you were a writer, and these all were people were discovering a different America. Well, and, and what Kerouac's great discovery is, his first novel he writes in New York is Town in the City. It's a traditional novel. If you read it, it it's much like B-plus level kind of Thomas Wolfe. It's a good book, but Wolfe's novels were better for this kind of long flow. But, after, so, but if you look at Town in the City, a big fat novel, a young guy writing it like that, he's got talent, Jack Kerouac. There's no quite, you don't write a novel that good in your 20s, even if it's derivative of Thomas Wolfe, to have the kind of a, a many brilliant passages in the book. But he knows in his heart it's derivative. And what he does is puts himself into a labor camp of reading all of Charles Dickens, all of Tolstoy, all of Dostoevsky. He reads Zane Grey Westerns, Emily Dickens in poetry. He puts Melville on a pedestal. And it's a generation that Kerouac in the 1940s that still had this great veneration for that writers were like heavyweight boxers. They were the huge champions of the world. And he reads and reads and reads. And he's mixing that with an infatuation with jazz music, which of course bebop into the, in the late 40s and into the, into the 50s. He's one of the only white faces going to Harlem. I mean, this is a Jim Crow South. And Kerouac, as a white Ivy League guy, going in is hanging out in all black bars till the wee hours of the morning, listening to people like Charlie Parker or Lester Young or Dizzy Gillespie, and not just listening to them, getting them. 
Kerouac would make very bold claims for our jazz musicians of the 40s and 50s, which really, up until maybe even a decade ago, seemed hyperbole. There is great, you know, Louis Armstrong's as great as Mozart. Well, that seemed to be a kind of trite thing, but now there are many scholars who say, my God, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, these people, Kerouac, he, he didn't just think they were entertainment. He felt they were the seminal artist of post-World War II America. And his observations about them have proven very strong and very solid. And the, what he felt, what empowered and infused on the road, unlike his first novel, Town in the City, was those jazz sounds. Because what he saw Kerouac is, is that there was an America he wanted to tap into. And that's the lonely midnight America that you find in Edward Hopper painters, paintings, or that you find in Billie Holiday songs, or that you find by sitting at the edge of the Grand Canyon at sundown. And it's that twilight in America, that dusk like it's outside right now, that can, when anything is possible at, if for the evening. You know, that you, you're, you might, you know, who knows where you're going to end up. Uh, if, you know, and he, um, he, he, the music, while he would start reading, so he would be up reading and practicing writing. The notebooks are extraordinary because he would play music, listen to radio, particularly jazz when he could, loved Frank Sinatra tremendously and crooners, Bing Crosby and all of them also. Um, but what's interesting about his On the Road diaries is almost every page he draws a crucifix and he writes about God. And his most famous things over and over again, he's, God, please let me be humble. He started seeing humility as the great um, sign of a true Christian. He was want, trying to dissolve his ego in many ways. And it's that caring, that insight Kerouac has of the historic Jesus or the, or, you know, there are many Christ in America today. It gets politicized a lot. But the Christ that Kerouac was tapping in was the one who, you know, loved, loved Barabbas on the cross, who found wisdom in, you know, whose, whose Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. That uh, homeless people. Kerouac at, it has an incredible ability for empathy for people on the street. He'd go and talk to a Bowery bum. And it wasn't, ooh, it's a Bowery bum. Uh, and, and, it, and it wasn't Stephen Crane, I'm going to do social realism about him. It was, I love you. I love you. What's your story? You've got to, I'm just a square idiot kid from, went to Columbia and I'm screwing up my life, but you've traveled. Tell me about your life. He was a great listener, Kerouac, to the stories of people that most people didn't listen to. And that is one of the reasons why there's a great religiosity in him, is that, so what, and what he started saying, and when his hero of On the Road becomes Neil Cassidy, the real human being, man named Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy was born in Salt Lake City. His father abandoned him. He was raised in orphanages. He was a con man, extraordinaire, was a car thief. I mean, this guy was, well, he was trouble. Yes, he had charisma. A lot of con, con people have charisma. But Kerouac saw him as a, not, not just as an anti-hero, but the anti-hero as the new American saint. Because what Kerouac was saying is, that, that in all of his conning and BSing and all, there's an authenticity to him. That he's not hung up on the dictates of structured society. And of course, existentialism, which is big in a post-war period of Camus and Sartre, it's all about that looking for the existential self, the authentic in all of us. It's, an out, it's a romanization of outlaw behavior and Kerouac falls into it. You can read On the Road, suddenly it's like, oh, we stole a holy tank of gas and drove, a, we, we pumped the gas in the car, didn't pay, and drove into Texas. Well, it, it's, that's, that's stealing. 
you know. He makes it sound as this great romantic swirl of, oh, you know, I mean, what if every one of you here just went and started, just go walked in the grocery store and started, st- you know. So there's that kind of, but in order to deal with that behavior or free love or in, in his novels, have a, a inter-sex inter, um, relationships, um, he was looking, and in this way is why he became an Atavar of the 60s, is he's looking for something more. And when he, his voice is coming together at a time when the people in the 1950s America are rejecting, particularly young people, the man in the gray flowered suit, Levitt Towns, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, suburban sprawl, the uh, 80 cans of Campbell's soup, pick your brand, the homogenization of America that's led to kind of the fast food, Walmartization. Each generation has new terms for it. When Kerouac's writing about going to Denver, he writes, I feel so sorry for the people in this housing development. They all have the same 2.2 kids with their same two cars, all watching their evening news on their same TV at the same time. And I'm here with a rucksack on in great American West, the wind blowing in my face, and I'm going to cook a campfire and have pork and beans, you know, on the side of the road. And, you know, and he's, it's self-congratulatory um, because he's, not, he's finding escape mechanisms from the trap of responsibility. Um, and, and that's a sentiment that one wants to bask in when you're young. It doesn't work when you're in your 40s and 50s. And it particularly doesn't work when you develop a, a dependency on alcohol, which Kerouac, when he died in, in, um, in Florida in the late 60s, it's, it's hemorrhaging really from alcohol-related causes. He never stopped that kind of partying motif. Yet, the discipline that he was able to apply himself in wanting to be a great writer. He said, I don't have children, although he had a children, a, a daughter, which he barely claimed. He met her, Jan Kerouac, at the end of his life. He said, my children are my books. It's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, he's writing these, and he's writing one after the other in an autobiographical fashion about himself. But the breakthrough book is on the road because it's the merging of that jazz spontaneity and with Roma- American Romanticism. It's Whitman and Wolf meets spontaneous jazz meets Catholicism. And in the, in the Catholicism part is the confession. Kerouac's always confessing. He's pulling, and even at one point says, I just want to pull on your lapels and confess everything that I did in my life. And you start feeling sorry for him when you read his journals because he would go out in New York and get drunk and do something that he didn't want to do. And then the next morning, he's holed up in his apartment and he's writing in his journals, I hate myself, I loathe myself, I can't believe I abused, you know, let myself act that way. He, he's very hard on himself. A self-hatred develops. And it really develops once On the Road's published. Because when it's published in 57, he now becomes the thinking, um, the thinking woman's James Dean. And he's going on these TV shows like Steve Allen's show and all of them. And he's becoming a bit of a celebrity. And all the time he's feeling he's losing his authenticity. And he becomes in many ways a hermit and he start, or starting to cut his associations with people, and he turns to Johnny Walker Red, bottles of it all the time. Considering the amount of alcohol he consumed, it's like F. Scott Fitzgerald, who ended up with the crash, it's amazing the productivity he was able to do. When I, I, when, I'm going to talk about the spontaneity in a minute, but I love young people reading Kerouac's On the Road today, because it's not a cynical book. Oddly, what's missing of all, I'm, I'm putting out a lot of psychosis here of Kerouac in many ways, but what he isn't is cynical per se, because he, even if, like, when, for example, and he's not political, he's apolitical. And he, when he sees like a businessman in a three-piece suit slips and falls on the ice, he writes a poem about, 
you know, how embarrassed he must be that he dropped his briefcase and looking. It's not like, you know, you, you know, it's not the confrontation of the 60s going on here. And in his journals over and over again, by the night after On the Road's published, he's begging, literally pleading with people not to constantly lump him as a beat writer. Allen Ginsberg had gone to India, had grown a, had, was wearing a long robe, had a long beard, um, was you know, dealing with really radical elements of the anti-war movement. Kerouac was for the Vietnam War. He was for it because he said, the guys I drink with at the bar in Lowell uh, are fighting over there, and I don't feel like I can be against them. I mean, some scholars made a big deal that his mother, who, who, who Kerouac made it, when Jack Kerouac's father was dying of stomach cancer, on his father's literally vomiting in a, ozone, in a queen's apartment, dying, he grabbed his son and said, Jackie, I, one thing, take care of your mother. So Kerouac's whole life after he stayed with his mother, he lived with his mother. Reece, up until recently, scholars made fun of him that there was something wrong with Kerouac because he lived up to his pledge with taking care of his mother. It was one of his truly honorable things he did in his life. She was intense and peasant-like, um, but, she had, but he, had, he wouldn't turn his back on her. And, of course, he moved to Florida with her. And, and um, you know, when, in, when he died, she, you know, she outlived him. But he, every money, every little bit of money he could make, and he was constantly being ripped off by people because uh, he couldn't financially deal with the sharks in New York that were grabbing and taking all these agents and people using his ideas for TV shows and never giving him any royalties. And he was, he was always struggling to make ends meet. And essentially, he was homeless. It's not just on the road trip. He moved to places like Hyannis, Northport, back to Lowell, Orlando, to St. Petersburg, leasing places where he could, just holding up enough to write his book um, be, um, and start plotting his next um, adventure. But with, I mentioned the word spontaneity to you in jazz. Kerouac believed in a concept of first thought, best thought. So since I've been talking, you all here are a magnetic field of thoughts. I, I'm not privy to any of them. You, some of you might be thinking about your home. I may have said something that triggered something in your personal life. Kerouac's view is let it out. Say what, whatever first comes to your mind, let it out. That he was trying to say that, that I'm trying to get rid of that filter. That I'd rather have some bad writing that was pure than, um, in, in, so it, than, than sterile writing. So it becomes first thought, best thought. Now, we know as scholars looking at his papers that, that, that he wasn't completely true to this. Kerouac write, revised and rewrote and revised and rewrote. And, and, but he liked the idea that his writing came out of this in burst, creative burst of three weeks, and I wrote the book. He loved to brag how fast he wrote the book. It only took me five weeks, you know, and in it. But now we can go through the drafts and see how he constantly restructured traditional. He did traditional, old-fashioned plotting ideas, character ideas. On the Road had so many changes of plots and characters until he came up with the motif of Neil Cassidy becoming his character Dean Moriarty as a new kind of Gene Autry hero, although he was a car thief who was searching for his father. But good looking, women loved him, macho, and once he had that essential buddy um, Scenario. I mean, it's like Huck Finn and Jim. I mean, it's a literary device. You know, the two go in search of America. He went searching for the father they never had. They went looking supposedly for Neil Cassidy slash Dean Moriarty's father. But that was just a mechanism to give Kerouac a chance to write in this spontaneous flow with the language of America. And Douglas, in a front page review of the New York Times book review, said probably Kerouac did more for experimental language than any American writer after World War II. And I think she may be largely right about that. He was influenced by Joyce and Proust a lot, and he wanted to create a new kind of American voice that would be have jazz and the loose structure of jazz. Remember, 
it doesn't mean jazz there's no structure. If, Lou, if, if Louis Armstrong's going to play um, when the Saints go marching in, the, or just let's take Miles Davis in the 50s playing the Saints go marching in, you can eventually recognize the, 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 the song. But on, depending on the mood, he might go in one direction. It might be a sad version. And, and then it comes back to the main, and then it drifts. And, but then it all comes back together again. And so you do these detours, almost like a road trip, but somehow it all kind of holds together. The, um, the love that he felt for Neil Cassidy was, was intense and great. It was the brother he never had in many ways. Cassidy was an amazing historic figure. Um, he most famously went on after Kerouac made, made him the hero of On the Road, a real living guy, you know, but changed his name. Um, Ken Kesey, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, hired him to be his bus driver for the bus further, which was the psychedelic bus in the 60s that went to unsettle America by holding LSD, Kool-Aid acid trips. So there's a direct link between 50s Jack Kerouac on the road to the counterculture of the 1960s. In the book Tom Wolfe, not to be confused with Thomas Wolfe, wrote called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Um, you know, he documents uh, Cassidy and Kesey and Babs and all these mountain girl and all the kind of hippie Bay Area generation. Kerouac had troubles with some of this. He did try LSD with Timothy Leary and wrote him a long letter about it. Kerouac wasn't that hot, keen on LSD. He, his actual line was, I don't like, walking on water wasn't made in a day. Um, of course, the band like The Doors in the 60s for, become popular, all building on Aldous Huxley's book, Doors of Perception. Kerouac worried that you keep going through the same door over and over again, that, you, that it was more through Buddhism that you'd find enlightenment than through drugs. And by the time On the Road got published in 57, Kerouac was headlong into Buddhist studies. Um, he's one of the people, along with Alan Watts, who wrote The Zen Way, but uh, who popularized Buddhism in the United States for a mainstream youth audience, Kerouac, in his book The Dharma Bums. Subsequently, there have been many Buddhist books, Sons of the Dharma, etc. He did not see a difference that he needed to disown Catholicism or Christianity or Buddhism. His view was bring it all on because it was all a deep sense of searching and as a religious seeker and as, as a person on a quest. But the other flip side of his religious seeking was a kind of barroom conservatism. And I once wrote a piece for the New York Times, the back page of the book review, trying to understand why Steinbeck was pro-Vietnam War, Ralph Ellison, James T. Farrell, John Dos Passos, Jack Kerouac, Nabokov. I went on and named all these American writers that were all for the war in Vietnam. When everybody thinks of the art community, probably are 10 heavyweight writers, but they're writers that got very invested, particularly Steinbeck and, and, and Dos Passos and Farrell and Kerouac with America. That was their big theme. Even when they were, do, the, the great, brilliant USA Today trilogy of Dos Passos was still so American and, exper and infused with this American. And Steinbeck's grace, the Grapes of Wrath may have been promoting socialism, as some people said, but what an American novel. They're using the landscape of America and the town names and, and people's accents. And so Kerouac in the 60s was not into abandoning America. He didn't like America with the K. There was a scene when he met the merry pranksters and Ken Kesey in their psychedelic bus when Kerouac took him, they were sitting on an American flag and he pushed them off and took the flag and folded it up military style. There, people thought he used to be joking when he used to say, I think Eisenhower is a great president. What's wrong with Ike? Because people thought that was, oh, don't you get it? It's a parody he's making by saying I like. No, he really liked Eisenhower. He was a subscriber to the National Review and admired William Buckley's show in the 60s. Now, some people would say that conservatism came from his alcoholism his, and, and his, his, uh, his um, 
personal, um, and that's been in the academy, a kind of view on it because, um, you know, people that love Jack Kerouac as a kind of liberal icon, progressive icon, can't stand to think that somebody they admired that much. In truth, he was always very working class, and as Ronald Reagan discovered, I mean, the blue-collar workers, and as Hillary Clinton showing versus Obama, there's some of blue-collar America is not anti-American. Blue-collar people aren't Trotsky and Mother Jones, as the intelligentsia of the new left in the 60s assumed. Kerouac is deeply always thinking about working people. One of the refreshing attitudes about him is his utter lack of elitism when he gets Finally, a publisher puts him on a first-class train compartment from New York to Florida. He, he said, I'll never ride in first class. When he was doing his later writings in the 60s, he'd go to a Kentucky Fried Chicken and sit. Here is an American icon whose place that he wrote his books was the Kentucky Fried Chicken in Orlando. Anybody in the New York literary set wouldn't go into a tuck. They, they had a snob appeal. He got very interested in who's working and the Mexican kid working behind the fast food restaurant and frying the chicken who drifted in over Mexico and thinking about his poor mother back there and what's the peso to the dollar and he got into that kind of mode because he didn't walk into an institution like Tucky Fried Chicken and think, oh geez, I don't go to these places. He took the place for what it was, he was proletarian. And proletariat, not in a left-wing Marxist kind of way, but proletariat, he was a worker's person, a people's person. He liked worker, working in America. Um, the book on the road this year, and the reason I'm here talking to you on this exhibit is here, is it's been 50 years. And, and it's sort of a, um, a marker for a lot of people. If I remember reading it at a Holiday Inn, and I'm not that generation, a lot of Americans remember it as a Bible when they're young. They dug out their old dog ear copies, 50 years of on the road. The book holds up. It is an American classic. It's not just a, um, uh, it, it is in the same league with the great Gatsby. Um, Allen Ginsberg used to compare it to Fitzgerald a lot. Um, you know, the Catholicism, the drinking, the defining of a generation, the crash. Um, but uh, he's up there with one of the, it's one of those novels, I mean, I think Catcher in the Rye is one of Alienation of Salinger, but there's certain books that you almost can't grow up now in America. It's pretty hard to be 25 and at all into the humanities and not have read On the Road. And it keeps selling like hotcakes for Viking Press. They bring out every kind of edition they can. They change the covers, they say here's the original edition anything for marketing because it just keeps selling and selling and selling and it's a people that discover him seem to discover his voice for the first time and it's a voice they like it's a voice that has love in it if you read on the road there's a love there there's confusion there's um, um, some some feelings of alienation but there's a love of people of spirit life there's a connection and, and yet Burroughs' work was very tied with narcissism and Andy Warhol in the factory and here's this Kerouac on this sort of spirit religio religiosity and here's Burroughs hard left in your face political theater they don't have a lot um, that, that groups them together except that they, they engage in a bohemian lifestyle um, but intellectually that's why Kerouac in, writes in his diaries and letters. I want to be seen as an American writer, like Steinbeck or Robert Frost. I want to be judged on my work. And today, in the academic community, we're judging him in his work, and the, we're, we're judging him very highly. And it's not just me as somebody who loves On the Road. Uh, all of his books, Visions of Cody, has become, and some people consider it a postmodern classic, um, you know, Dharma Bums is, and, and the Subterraneans are, are just incredible books. Desolation, um, 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 the uh, Desolation Angels, a, a, a classic um, book. And many people have been influenced by Kerouac. Most famously, probably Bob Dylan, who went with Allen Ginsberg on their Rolling Thunder Review bus tour 
of 1976 and went to Lowell and sat on Kerouac's grave and read, Kerouac wrote a book of poems called Mexico City Blues and sat on the grave and, and read and sang his books Dylan and Ginsburg did to celebrate Jack Kerouac. He's influenced rock and roll tremendously, people like David Byrne, everybody in the rock. And Tom Waits has actually put to music. If you read the novel on the road, there's a little poem in the back about Truckee and uh, old, I go down to Old Medora in North Dakota and I'm traveling the, the, the he's naming all these American name places. The recording artist Tom Waits has recently put that to song. His name is just mentioned as shout outs in Van Morrison songs and Patti Smith, on and on. Dizzy Gillespie did a composition called Kerouac um, early on, recognizing that there was something special as, about it. And for people that want to find a book that captures jazz, which is hard, there's nothing that, that replaces music. It's hard being a music writer because the music is so close as we've got as a great jazz-infused novel remains on the road. And it captures a kind of bebop innocence of midnight America when the GI Bill and the, and the kind of drifter mentality of an America that had just won the Second um, World War. And they, while On the Road is the preeminent book, it's the classic, all of his books are back in print. In fact, it's better and sadder than that. I mean, people are literally publishing scraps I mean, if the guy like wrote a list of a uh, grocery list, it's getting published by somebody right now. I mean, it's uh, the, anything he ever wrote. And people all over the country, you know, George Washington slept here, and well, now the big thing is Jack Kerouac drank here. You go all over, I was just in Ogden, Utah, where the bar is a whole set, here's where Jack Kerouac was in this bar and drank here on this date and through all of his wanderings. But he is a, he's a difficult, figure to understand because when I mention persona writers, I'm the literary executor of Hunter Thompson's estate. Hunter was all persona writer. Hunter S. Thompson, fear and love, I mean, all he would do was try to create, Kerouac created the big persona, but it boomeranged on him. He was embarrassed to answer the door one afternoon in Florida before his death, a bunch of kids came over all wearing Dharma bums t-shirts wanting to meet the great Jack Kerouac, and they met a middle-aged guy with a pot belly who was losing his hair. And Kerouac wrote he was humiliated. These kids wanted a handsome, you know, the guy that was in his 20s, and now he was a middle-aged man. He became a hostage in many ways, um, Kerouac to his persona, which is larger than life today. Kerouac's like Elvis Presley or something. I mean, it's that kind of large, his persona, we missed the man, uh, some aspects of the real guy and the positive aspects of Kerouac was if he walked out of here and saw, uh, and, and it, 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 it has tinged with it a mental uh, instability. But he would walk and if he'd see a bird with a broken wing, he would try to mend the wing of the bird and he'd sit and cry because the bird was wounded. He would go into bars and scream at hunters in hunting bars to, put, to get rid of their rifles and how dare they kill a deer. Uh, he had a sense of this soul of things, which is reflecting back to Thoreau, but Thoreau was a hunter. I mean, Thoreau ate the heart of a woodchuck with his bare hands. I mean, seriously. I mean, he wrote, I mean, so this is, Kerouac is, is there's, a, there's a pacifism to him, and at the big message is all of this is just a game, the rat race, you're all living in a dream, you're all born, you're all going to die, you all have loves, you all have despairs, and as he says and ends the on the road, the only thing all of us here in the audience know for sure is the forlorn rags of growing old. I mean, that, that's, that's, he's writing this in a, in, as a young man in his 20s, but that's all there is in life. We're all, I'm, all, I'm going to end up, we're all going to afford the indignities of growing up to be an old man. So what's Kerouac's solution? Can you beat that? Either you become a monk and get in touch with God and say, no, there's a higher calling, which he often do, or as an on the road, he writes, I'm going to go, go, go. Don't stop, don't look back, 
just go. The ones for me in life are the mad ones, the ones who never say a boring thing, the ones who are always filled with enthusiasm and action and spirit that moves. Life, you know, I'm gonna, it's that I'd rather burn out than fade away. That's a lot of fun when you're in your 20s, but when you're in your 40s and your body's not cooperating. You can't burn, 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 and go, 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 and that anymore. It, that the end of that road is going to be premature death, and it's tragedy, and it's one that people that have alcoholism face and people that do have drug abuse um, face when they get onto that kind of track. And in those ways, that's the Kerouac people you want to have a, a bit of a warning with. He's not a, you can't just adopt Kerouac as a full lifestyle or as a role model. <laughs> And, but if many young people in their 20s do because you're, you're, you're seeing the, the reality of mid, middle age. And when he became middle age, to his credit, he continued working hard, doing a lot of books, trying to continue in understanding things. And all of his books are valuable. And I hope from my talk today, you not just read On the Road, but if you read that one, try a couple of his other books out. Um, we can say because my topic is Kerouac's America, that Jack Kerouac was a great American because he cared enough about the country, its rivers. When I would sit at the, I'm gonna end by telling you the one part of On the Road I think about the most, and it's in his journals when he's traveling the country, but he just sits on the bank in New Orleans watching a log float down the Mississippi River and he's imagining a lumberjack up in Montana who may have chopped wood and this one log on the river and now it's traveling down the Missouri and then it's going down you know to the Mississippi and then that log's gonna he calls it a an, his odyssey log and the log now if you sit there at the bank long enough and watch it you'll see the log moving past and it goes in the Gulf and eventually it may end up on the shores of Africa but he was playing a romanticism about American roads, cafes, cowboys, movies, flop houses, brothels. You know, his girlfriend and on the roads, a migrant worker. There's problems with that. The girl that he meets, he's romanticized. He's like, I got to pick grapes with a migrant worker for a week. Well, it's not fun being a migrant worker. This woman was living in other poverty. On the other hand, other writers weren't giving dignity to Mexican migrant um, women. He was treating them, and it's the same with African Americans. He writes on the road, I'd rather, I wanna be black. Because the front porches of black communities, there's an ecstasy and a joy there. And they're out at night having a barbecue, and I hear their laughter, and back in my white community, we're all so boring. <laughs> I wanna be black. But it's not a political statement. It's just, it's an ecstasy of the moment of wanting to be kind of caught up. And in order to write like he did on the road, it's all journal notes. It's like a reporter. He constantly kept spiral notebooks and writing. So every neighborhood he'd see, he'd write. But he'd go into buildings, just like I gave the Kentucky Fried Chicken example. Very few people would think there's a story to walk in at a Quizno sub. We all know Quiznos, so what's there there? We basically park the car, we might have a coupon, we get her or whatever, we get our sub and go. He's over there looking at, you know, look at the, 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 these, and he writes about food beautifully, plastic bottles, putting the mayonnaise, which was the eggs and the mayonnaise were raised in Iowa by a farmer whose daughter, you know, <laughs> on and on and on. Every object, he would see a story like that behind it. And in those ways, he, he was a creative genius who never sold out, who never uh, always kept to the authentic beat, not the mercantile beat of the moment. People marketed Jack Kerouac. People tried to pigeonhole him, but he kept a kind of um, his spirit alive and open um, all of his life. And that's something also that we can honor on the 50th anniversary of On the Road. He said in his diaries he would have loved, to, he wanted, what he wanted most for his works is for a lot of PhD dissertations to be written on his work. Now that might seem odd for a guy who people think he wanted to be taken serious. And Tom Staley and the Ransom Center here on the 50th anniversary of On the Road have taken Jack Kerouac very seriously. And, his, um, and as his Library of America, who I just edited the On the Road volume, which he would have loved that he would, 
he's there now in the Library of America classics, Jack Kerouac books, there with Melville and Thoreau and Whitman and the people he much so wanted to be part of that pantheon. And due to grit, due to talent, and due to a very special religiosity and, and, uh, and special spirit, he's earned his ranks and, uh, and I hope you all don't worry about listening to me today, but go out and read Jack Kerouac because it's worth the trip. Thank you. I hope I didn't jump around too much, but I thought in the spirit of Kerouac, I shouldn't be too academically stiff. But I'd love to take some questions. How are we for time? Two? Okay. I went a little too long, but we'll, we'll go, we'll rattle them off. Anybody? Yes, sir. Somebody's emailed me about that recently. Oh, that, that, that. It's, uh, and I'm looking, I have to look for it when I have time. I'm writing a book right on Theodore Roosevelt. But it's a story about a ban some of the banning of books. But we'll talk afterwards about that. It's such a micro thing. Anyone else? Yes. Um, the letters that that he wrote. Um, Cassidy's letters influenced Kerouac tremendously. Those are the most important bits of writing. There's a City Lights Books has done a book called The First Third, which is only marginally good. Uh, there's some good writing in it, but it's not. A, it's kind of it's it's failed in a lot of ways. But the letters that he wrote are extremely important and gave him not uh, just because he wrote in a kind of unhinged, authentic voice, so he could riff off of in Visions of Cody. He's actually tape recording Neil Cassidy as Cody and trying to capture some of that spontaneity of voice of, um, of Cassidy. But there, it'd be hard to overestimate the influence, but it's, it's, you know, there, look, when you're a writer like Kerouac, you're looking for somebody like that. He later looked for Gary Snyder, the poet, to be the Zen naturalist who's the hero of the Dharma bombs. And, and he's looking for a person you could build a narrative like that around. He, he did well by picking Cassidy and Snyder on those two books because they are both were our very important American figures. Gary Snyder is one of our finest poets alive today, honored by American Academy of Letters, and maybe one of our two or three best naturalist poets alive, and Kerouac honed in on him um, that early on as Jaffe Ryder in the Dharma Bums. One more? Yes. It's a good, uh, the, one, uh, a friend of mine and a, a fine writer named Joyce Johnson who wrote a book on Jack Kerouac who had a love relationship with him. She wrote a book called Minor, Minor Characters. It won the National Book Award. Joy, she's done other things about him too, but that's her most famous. Joyce is one who believes, has a, the theory that it's important to look at him as essentially being homeless because, uh, first off, I don't know if you all realized, he didn't drive. He didn't have a driver's, he didn't know how to drive a car. So the key guy of on the road going in the country was bumming rides from people all the time. Part of why he may have picked Neil Cassidy is he knew how to drive, steal a car and get out of town, you know. Um, you know, you know so that's, um, you know, but anyway. What, what was the what question again? The, oh, the, he made this pact with his father to take care of his mother, and what he would do is go on these spurts for a while, collect notes, and then come back and hole up with her paying his publishing checks, which are very meager royalty checks, to try to keep up a place. And whenever it got too expensive, they move again, move again, move again, because there was no way to make it on a writer's salary. Um, yet he didn't want to leave her um, you know, um, destitute, so he tried to earn whatever he could. She was a bit of a protector of him, um, meaning like with William Burroughs or Ginsburg came to the door, she wouldn't let them in. 
<laughs> because she was um, very old-fashioned and thought that there were bad influences on her, her son. Um, he may have used his mother as a refuge to write. It was a very dysfunctional relationship in a lot of ways. Here's a grown man living at home with his mother, living at a, renting a place, having her there. But it kept him in, and she would put hot meals on the table, and he'd be able to work. In many ways, we owe his mother a lot for his books because she, she was a caretaker while he was going through those Herculean bouts of, uh, of you know, pouring out that the kind of exhausting energy doing a book like that does. I'd better stop, but I'll take any afterwards. <laughs>